Good morning. Hey, it is, uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. It is good to spend time in his word this morning. I'm looking forward to getting the chance just to kind of uh, to spend some time with you this morning. As many of you guys know, uh, I, I work in the line of students and have been here for 13 years, kind of running in the lane of students here. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, uh, to speak on stage multiple times and I'm excited that uh, Pastor Matt has given me the opportunity this morning to kind of step in and, and to lead this morning. Now, I will tell you, because I work in students, I always try to, to give a little bit of a, a like, hey, prior to my service, get ready, because I do speak a little bit fast at times. When I get excited, I speak really quickly, and so I need you to jump into the fast lane with me, and let's push the gas, and let's roll, um, because we got a lot to cover, and and just a lot of opportunity to kind of step into the Word. A couple of months ago, uh, Matt came to me and said, hey, I I want you to preach on this Sunday. And so at that point in time, I started kind of thinking. Uh, It was a lot more advanced notice than I'd ever received before. And I I thought, man, I got a lot of time to prep. I got a lot of time to think through this. And he had kind of laid out the year for us and kind of shown us where we were going. And I thought, well, I I really need to to, to land kind of in that lane where it's at and kind of roll through some of these things that we're going through as a church. And, And I couldn't come up with anything. It was like I kept coming up. I had some amazing messages for students. I had amazing messages for opportunities to step into the life of, of a Wednesday night or, or, or a Friday morning at an FCA, but I just couldn't land where God wanted to take us this morning. And about three weeks ago, um, my son comes into my office. Now I have three kids. Most of you guys know that, but I have a seven-year-old. My seven-year-old is like no other kid. He has lots of energy, uh, loves to go. Uh, he, is, he keeps me going all the time. And he comes to my office and on my, on my, my wall, I have this kind of glass marker board uh, to kind of make me feel hip and stuff. And so I, so I have this board, I, I write things on it every once in a while, I have a little thought, I'll, I'll write something on it if I have maybe a message kind of ideas, I, I write things on it and, um, throughout the week. And, and when he comes in uh, on Wednesdays after he's gotten out of school and he comes up here, he likes to draw on it. And so like any other kid, he pulls the markers out and he starts drawing all over it and stuff like that. But about three weeks ago, he didn't draw, he wrote something on it that just really just kind of took me by surprise. I wasn't expecting it. And, and a lot of times I don't always pay attention to what he's writing because you never know. Sometimes it's like something silly. Sometimes he's drawing something silly and you're like, oh yeah, that looks just exactly like what you just drew. You know, you just kind of go with it and you're kind of excited about it. But he wrote this, this statement on my board that, that stuck with me. And today's message is actually built off of the statement that he wrote on my board. He wrote on my board, Um, He wrote, be the reason someone smiles today. And I thought, well, okay, that's good. But then after that, he followed up with, be the reason somebody sees God in Jesus. And I thought, wow, I'm expecting to see like some kind of goofy giraffe or some kind of like crazy, silly, because if you've been around my seven-year-old, he likes to, he's like every other seven-year-old boy, uh, you know, he he likes to do silly things, make silly jokes and, and write those up there. But this time he didn't. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really good. That's, that's a sermon waiting to happen, right? And I started thinking, that, that's, that's exactly where I'm gonna go this morning. That was about three weeks ago. He's been mad at me ever since because I won't let him erase the marker board. He's like, when can I erase that? When are you preaching that sermon? Like I told him, I was like, dude, I gotta keep this because I, I, I truly feel like God is using what you just wrote uh, to, to truly just kind of speak. Last night as I was sitting in my room, um, I tried to get away the night prior to preaching just to spend some time alone, uh, just to... Uh, to kind of preach my sermon, basically. I stand up, I kind of walk through my sermon, I kind of speak through it as part of what I do, uh, just to prepare to make sure that I feel like we're everywhere we're supposed to be in this morning. And uh, and so I I, I try to find myself alone uh, in that moment. My son walks up to my room during this time and he looks at me and says, hey, you preaching my sermon tomorrow? I'm like, (laughs) yes, son, I am. I'm I'm preaching your sermon tomorrow. He said, well, let me see it. I'm like, okay. Um, so So I show him my sermon. Um, so he can, you know, tell me what I'm doing right and wrong. Um, and, and he reads it and he says, uh, he said, daddy, that's, that's not exactly what I said. I said, son, you only said two sentences. I have to write a whole lot more than two sentences to make a sermon. Okay. I only get this a little while. So, Hey, we're going to, he said, but you added a whole lot more. I said, I know son, I had to, they would have loved it if you'd have preached just those two sentences and we'd have been out in five minutes, but we're not going to be that way this morning. Okay. So he approves of this morning's message, uh, after kind of looking at it last night. And so I, I bring all that together to say that it's amazing how God speaks to us sometimes. 
It's really neat how, how God uses even our children to speak into our own personal lives. And so this morning, as we step into the word, I want us to be challenged with this understanding that God has called us to be the reason that people see and experience and know and acknowledge who God is. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, we're going to read this. We're going to spend some time in this. We're going to jump into some other verses this morning as well, but this is going to be kind of a key verse for the morning. Prior to this verse, I want to kind of give you a little background of what's going on. Peter has been just talking about how Christ is the capstone, the cornerstone, the foundation of the house of God. He's been, he's been pouring that in and he's been saying the world did not receive him. They've kind of just walked all over him. They've tripped over him. He didn't come in the way they expected him to. Um, he didn't act the way they expected him to. That he came like a servant when they were expecting a king. Um, he came suffering and they expected a conqueror. And, and so the Jews had rejected him uh, in his coming. People had rejected him because he was not what they had expected him to be. And so therefore, Peter is basically saying they're just stumbling over him. They're stumbling over what he has done, what, who he is. And then all of a sudden we get to 1 Peter chapter 2 and he says, but you. He says, you are a chosen people. He says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the, his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as far, foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see or they may observe your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. See, the key thing is there that when, when Peter is speaking, he says, but you, you're different. You are to be different. You are to show people the reason. You are to live out. You are to be the reason that people experience this gospel of Jesus. But in order for us to be the reason, there's a couple of things I'm going to walk through. I've got four things that I want us to walk through this morning. The first thing is this, in order for us to be the reason, we have to know the reason. We have to know this reason. We've got to know that we are a chosen people. We have to know that, that we are to be drastically different from this world, that we are not to look, smell, taste like this world. But so many times that's exactly what we're yearning to do is to fit in. But God has said, no, no, you are to be different because you are a chosen people. You are somebody that is set apart. You are royalty. You are a holy nation. You are to be different. Jesus even says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he says, you are the salt of this earth. He says, you are different from anyone else. You are the salt, but it's, it's key that he uses the word salt because I need you to understand that when Jesus uses the word salt, he is using it in such a way that we understand that it is an extremely important mineral. In the Hebrew society, it was a necessity for life. Salt was a necessity for them to have life. And so what scripture tells us when Jesus says, you are the salt, it says, you are a necessity for people to experience true life. Not to experience a life that's going to just last a second and go away because of those monetary short-term little fulfillments that are happening. No, you are a necessity as a follower, as a chosen one, as one that is living, that we know him, that we are the reason you are a necessity for this world to have life. So he uses the word salt. There's also six other functions of salt. Salt is used to preserve something from decaying, from something from, from falling apart. Salt is a preservative. Salt is also a texture enhancer. It enhances the texture of a food. It is, it is something that brings flavor to food. Now, I'm not a big salt person. I, I, I don't like a lot of salt in my food. However, there's certain things in my life that have to have salt. Green beans, for example, gotta have some salt on them, right? Um, I, I just, I, I gotta have some salt in my green beans. I went the other morning 
um, to a, a Happy Hearts Valentine's thing. And, and some of you may be in the room with us that were there. Um, they, they did this really, really nice uh, luncheon. And so we, we as the staff got to go in and sit and eat lunch with them. And, and I was sitting at a table with, this, with this, uh, this group here. And, and I just asked, I said, hey, do you, do you mind passing the salt? And uh, one of the, the gentlemen looked at me and said, yeah, us senior adults, they don't put any salt on our food. So I was like, well, okay. And so I was like, can I put some on there? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. Give it to me when you're done, right? And so like, we realized very quickly that we had something in common, that, that we have to, that salt brings such a flavor to our food. There's so many things that it does. It preserves, it brings texture, but it brings flavor, but it's also a nutrient source. Sodium is needed to help relax and contract muscles in your body. It conducts nerve impulses and sustains the proper balance of minerals and water in your body. So salt is an extremely important mineral. It is a binder. It is a color enhancer. For those of us in here that like to eat a hot dog every once in a while, salt helps the color of that hot dog stay the color it is. Without that salt, the longer it sits out, the grayer that hot dog gets, the muddier looking it gets. And you're like, I ain't eating that thing, right? (laughs) It's not for me. But that salt helps enhance that color. It also helps caramelize the, 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 the crust of bread to give you that beautiful color on top of that and butter. Um, but it's, it's important, right? Salt is an extremely important meal. And the Hebrew society understood how important it was when Jesus says, you are the salt of the world. He says, I need you to understand, you preserve the world from decay. When we know the reason We understand that you and I live in a world that is decaying, that is falling apart because of sin. It is a world that is led in a direction that God never wanted it to go, and it is is dying. And it says we have to be the reason. We've got to know the reason so that we can be the reason, so that we can help preserve this world, so that we can step into this world and tell them there's another way. And his name is Jesus. It's not living a life of sin. It's not living a life of of just following our own personal desires, but it is truly knowing who Jesus is. And so you need to understand in order for us to know the reason, you have to realize that you preserve the world from decay, but you also, when we know the reason, you understand that you have value. You have value. You are God's special possession. Therefore, we should live as one that is valuable. We should live as one that brings value to a world that needs value. But we'll never live as one that is valuable until we know the one that brings us value. Another thing we have to understand is you are to be radically different, set apart from this world, not like this world. If we're gonna be the reason that people experience Christ, if we're gonna be the reason that people hear the gospel, then we've gotta be different from this world. We can't just keep running in the same lanes we've always run in and expect some different result. Instead, we have to realize that we're radically different. Craig Rochelle, who's the pastor of Life Church, one of the largest churches in the nation, his church also created the Bible app. They were a big part of that. He writes, uh, or he quotes this. He says, you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Sandy, you understand, you and I have been called to live differently, free from the bondage of sin, but don't use your freedom to continue to sin. Don't use your, hey, I'm a Christian, so it's okay. I'm a Christian, so I'll be forgiven, right? No, when we know the reason, we're no longer gonna sit there and go, it's okay to sin. No, let us not use that freedom that we've been given, that forgiveness that we've been given to continue to satisfy our sinful nature. Instead, let us walk out and let us show people the love of Christ. Let's let them see who Christ is. See, many of us come into church We step into church and we step into church and we leave church the same way as we do and work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I don't know anybody that walks into their work and says, I'm ready to go back. I mean, we want the check, right? Some of us do love our jobs. 
But there's still something that's got to be different about when we step into worship. It's not a job to worship. It's an opportunity. Why? Because we know. We know a God that sets us apart. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into a wonderful light. So we know the reason. We declare it. Second thing is this, is we've got to experience the reason. We have to experience the reason. In order to be the reason that's, gonna, that's really going to reach people, that's going to lead people, that's going to help people see who Christ is, in order for us to be that reason, we've got to experience the reason. That's different than just knowing I can know something all day and not experience it, right? Like I, I, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to experience jumping out of a plane. Some of us like, I, I would never do that. I never thought I would do it either. It was, it was kind of one of those moments in my life. It was like, a, like a, I was about to turn 40 kind of moment. I'm like, gotta do something stupid, right? And so I thought, hey, why not strap myself to a little bitty dude and uh, let's jump out of a plane together, right? Because that sounds like an amazing experience. Um, it, it was, it was cool. But see, we all have desires for experiences. The reason you go on a vacation, you want an experience that, like you've never had before, right? The reason you spend so much money stepping into different things, whether it's, 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 it's a house or a job or, a, or whatever, it's because you desire an experience. We all want experiences and we pay lots of money for experiences. We all want these moments that we can look back at and go, that was amazing, that was so good. We want these experiences in the same way we need these experiences in our walk with Christ as well so that when we walk out of here, we're walking over that same adrenaline rush that we get out of worldly things. That adrenaline rush that says, I got to go show people. I got to go tell people. I've got to experience them like never before. In Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56, there's a story of two people kind of intertwined in this story. It's an amazing story of, of, of this man the name of Jairus, who was, who was literally, um, he, he loved the Lord. He understood who Jesus was. But he had a young daughter of 12 years old who was dying. Now, prior to this story, Jesus has been out doing some pretty amazing things. This is right prior to this was he was in the bottom of the boat. And all the disciples were up on the top. And a storm comes in and the storm is is. is, is just pushing the boat back and forth and they're, 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 they're terrified. So they run downstairs and they're like, Jesus, are you just gonna let us die? And he goes, hey, where's your faith? He calms the storms and they're like, man, this guy can speak to the storms. Right after that, he goes on land. And as he steps on land, there's, there's this demon possessed man with a demon named Legion, cause there was many. I preached on that, I think my last sermon. But he, he literally, he, he calls that demon out of that man and throws him into some pigs and they run off. And then at this point in time, there's a lot of things going on. A lot of ministry is starting to happen. And so people have heard of Jesus and you've got this man, Jairus, who is who's saying, man, I've got a, a daughter of 12 years old who's about to die. I've got to go experience this Jesus. I've got to go get him. I got to bring him back home. So he runs into town. And he comes and tries to find Jesus. In the midst of that same story, there's another story that's happening. Because there's a young lady at the same time who has been bleeding for 12 years. So intertwined in this story, you have two people. A, a, a man who's wanting to save the life of his daughter and a young lady who is desiring to be healed. Both running to Jesus for an experience. As Josh runs to Jesus, he, he, he kneels at the feet of Jesus and says, Jesus, I need you to come to my house. I need you to come and save my daughter. We need to experience you in our household today, Jesus. Don't go anywhere else. And all of a sudden, in the midst of his, his, his just pouring out to Jesus, Jesus has that moment. Maybe you and I have had that moment in life where you're talking to somebody, and then all of a sudden you look at him and you're like, they ain't even listening, are they? You know what I mean? Like you have, and, you, and, and if you're married, you just don't say anything, right? You know that. You're like, 
I ain't saying nothing. I'll just start over, right? You know, I'll start my conversation. But you, you've had this moment where you're looking at something, they're, they're looking off, something's happening. That's kind of what's happening here. This guy is literally pouring out to Jesus, and Jesus is kind of like, wait, wait, hold up. And he's like, Jesus, are you not seeing me here? I'm begging you to come to my house. I need you to be here. And he goes, hey, somebody just touched me. And he's like, Jesus, there's, there's a lot of people around. You're getting bumped. The disciples look at him and says, Jesus, I, I know you've walked on water. I know you've done some pretty cool things. Did you not notice there's a big crowd around us right now? You're getting bumped like crazy. He says, no, no, no. Somebody touched me because I just felt the healing power come for me. And all of a sudden the story changes and he goes, who was it that touched me? And this young girl in the midst of this tragedy that is happening in this other family's life, this young girl has just now been healed by experiencing Jesus, and she looks up and says, it was, it was me. He said, why'd you touch me? He said, because I knew that you could, you could heal me. I needed an experience that would change my life, and I was willing to put my hands out and touch you to make it happen. And he looks at her and says, hey, your faith has healed you. At the same time, in this story, when he looks at that young girl and says, your faith has healed you. Jairus is over here. Jairus is over here and, and his servants come to him and they say, your daughter just died. Imagine what he was thinking. If you would have just come, why, why, why was it so important? And now, I, man, my life is falling apart right now. Why, why don't you just come on and fix this for me? This doesn't make sense. But all of a sudden, Jesus looks at me and says, hey, let's go to your house. See, I need you to understand something today. We can never allow your circumstance to impact the intensity of God's calling on your life. This man was in the midst of a circumstance that he was like, my life is falling apart. And it was impacting his faith. Because he's like, hey, it's, it's pointless now. She's gone. And Jesus says, no, it's not. Let's go to your house. Scripture says they went to his house, and then they get to the house. Everyone is, is weeping and mourning and crying over the life of this young girl. They, they miss the miracle that just happened. And they're at the house, and they're crying and mourning. And they, they look at Jesus and say, she's, she's dead. And he goes, no, she's not. She's just asleep. And the scripture says they start to laugh at him going, who is this guy? I, we've touched her. We know she's dead. We have felt her. She's not breathing. She's gone. In the midst of this circumstance, I, I, I don't have that faith that you want me to have, Jesus. My calling? Pfft. But then Jesus says, hey, you know what? Let's go into the room. And he pushes everybody else out. And sometimes I wonder why he pushed everybody else out, but that's a whole nother sermon, I'm sure. But he pushes everybody out and he walks in with him and two disciples and, and Jairus and his wife. And he walks into this room with a, with a 12-year-old daughter who's dead and he shuts the door. He says he reaches over and grabs her hand and when he grabs her hand, she takes a breath. She breathes. Now, just go with me for a second. Scripture may not tell this, but this is the way my mind likes to work. Imagine with me for just a second. As he grabs her hand, she, she takes a breath. And the minute she takes a breath, I know what I would do as a dad. I would just start screaming with excitement. I would just be going crazy. My wife would be going nuts. We would be jumping on her and hugging her. We'd be picking her up. We would be going crazy. So that's what I'm imagining is happening at this point in time in this room. That craziness is going on and everyone outside the room is going, what is happening in there what is going on I mean you got to know they're probably like trying to look through the people in the door they're seeing like feet moving on the ground they're like no I was just in there she was dead and now wait wait I hear a little girl now all of a sudden what is happening in there and all of a sudden this young girl comes to life see I need you to understand something in the midst of all your circumstances in the midst of everything in order for us to be the reason that people see Christ in order for us to live this is we got to experience him in such a way that we allow him to do miracles in our life because we know who's in the room because Jesus was in the room 
There was an experience that happened that nobody could ever explain. See, I need you to understand, as long as Jesus is in the room, as long as he's in the room, we can live out some amazing experiences. So I want you to understand, don't doubt what the Lord can do just because you can't comprehend it. A lot of us don't, we don't, we don't jump into these experiences with Christ because they don't make sense to us. We don't allow him to step into the, we don't even make room for him to step into our lives because it doesn't make sense. But when he's in the room, it's when miracles happen. So in order for us to be the reason that people hear the gospel, see the gospel, see who Jesus is, we have got to experience him. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. See, I need you to understand that for some of us, we need to abstain from the things that are keeping us and we just need to take a shot for Jesus today. We need to take the shot so that we can experience him. So that we can, you know, when I, when, I, when I was thinking through that, I thought, you know, for many years, I had a chance to go to children's camp. I enjoy going to children's camp for a couple of days um, and I hang out with uh, the fifth graders, getting to know the fifth graders before they step into our student ministry. But many years ago, they used to do this archery at, at there um, and, and they would give them like real bows and arrows. And I thought, wow, this is, mm, this is something else, right? Let's put the hand, let's put a bow and arrow in the hand of a third grader and this is gonna be amazing. They don't do that anymore. I'm pretty sure I know why. I'm sure there's a counselor with an arrow in their arm somewhere. Um, but I remember one of the things that we would do is these kids were never really strong enough to pull it back. And so they would always have a hard time pulling that bow. They would grab it wrong. They'd put the arrow on. The minute they would put the arrow on, the arrow would fall and they'd be like, you know, whatever. They would have all these kind of moments. And, and it made me think of this, this Charles Spurgeon illustration that I heard back when I was taking some seminary classes. And it, and it, and it reads like this. It's, it's from the Complete Works book from Charles Spurgeon. If you don't know who Charles Spurgeon is, he was a pastor, he was a theologian back in the 1800s, phenomenal man of the word, doctrinally sound theologian. But he writes this as an illustration. Here's a youth who is to be initiated in the arch, art of archery. And then he carries a bow. It is a strong bow and therefore very hard to draw. Indeed, it requires more strength than the boy can summon to bend it. See how his father teaches him. Put your right hand here, my boy, and place your left hand so. Now pull, and as the youth pulls, his father's hands are on his hands, and the bow is drawn. The boy draws the bow, but is quite as much his father too. We cannot draw the bow alone. Sometimes a bow of steel is not broken by our own hands, for we cannot even bend it. And the Holy Ghost puts his mighty hand over ours and covers our weakness so that the draw, what splendid drawing of the bow it is then. The bow bends so easily, we wonder how it is. Away flies the arrow and it pierces the very center of the target for he who gives the strength directs the aim. And we rejoice to think that we have won the day, but it was his secret might that made us strong and to him, be the glory of it all. See, for us to experience Christ, we've got to allow him to come into our lives and to allow us to be pulled back. Now, some of us think, well, I'm, I'm pretty pulled right now. I'm pretty stretched. I'm like the string of that bow. And I'm having a hard time truly experiencing Christ. That's why my, my life's not really showing who Christ is. I'm having a hard time. It's hard for me to take a shot. But can I tell you, the further you pull that bow back, the further that arrow flies, sometimes I believe that, that, that God's allowing us to be pulled back so that we may fly even further with him. In the same way, we have to be willing to take the shot and go to Jesus and chase after Jesus, just like the young lady that was bleeding, just like Jairus did when he said, hey, I need an experience with you, Lord. And I know that when you're in the room, that's where worship happens. I know that when you're in the room, I will experience things that I never thought were possible. The third thing is this. In order to be the reason, we not only have to know the reason and experience the reason, we've got to invest in the reason. 
Now to invest is a big word that we, we, we not really a big word, but it's a word that we, we think of typically just with money. We're investing something in, but I wanna read a definition of invest to use that says like this. It says to use, to give, or to vote. To use, to give, or to vote, time or talent as for a purpose to achieve something. So I need you to understand in everything we do, is what you're investing in the best use of your talents and your time? Is what you're investing in the best use of your talents and of your time? So many of us invest in so many things. We invest our time in so many things that really have no purpose. See, I want you to understand the greatest enemy of our calling is investing in things that don't matter. The greatest enemy of our calling is investing in things that aren't gonna make a difference in the world. They don't matter. We invest in these things thinking, oh, they're gonna change my life. They're gonna change people around me. But in reality, we've been called to share a gospel. We've been called to go and to share the love of Jesus. We've been called to step out and to make disciples. We've been called to be different. We've been called to love the Lord with all we've got. But because of what we're investing in, it's impacting our calling. You know, I remember when my my oldest, who was young, there was this show called Blue's Clues. Some of you lived that nightmare with me, um, with Blue's Clues. Some of you are like, no, it was the purple dinosaur for us. Um, they're both nightmares that, that none of us want to go back to. But Blue's Clues was one of those, that just, it was just one of those shows that we, for some reason we invested a whole lot of time into. I remember um, this was a show that where you had this, this guy who, who literally kind of talked to these weird animals and things. His name was Steve, right? And Steve would come on and he would, he would spend time. And I understand it was educational. It was trying to teach people. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the story, Steve, I guess, gets old. And so they bring in his cousin, Joe. And it was one of those moments in life where I remember looking back and going, I think Steve just got fired. Um, and so they brought in Joe. Um, and so Joe comes in and then you've got these characters like uh, Side Table, um, which I don't understand the purpose of Side Table and Mr. Saw. And then you had Blue the dog. And that was like the main character. And then all of a sudden as you got further on into the show, uh, you had like the, the dog next door that uh, is like Fuchsia Cobalt or Magenta or something like that. I don't really know what his name was. It was one of those kind of names. But I remember investing so much time into this show. I remember buying the VHS tapes, right? That was like when you, when you bought VHS because you couldn't stream it kind of thing. I feel old when I say that because I'm you know, you, you're, are you really? Yes, I am that old. Um, but you got these, these VHS tapes. We used to have stacks of them, right? Because they took up so much space. Like our closet was like pfft, every VHS tape. We had the Blues Coos White. When we go places, we had to take the VHS and we got there, we could stick it in and go, just please be quiet and watch Blue's Clues, right? So we invested so much time into the show, but I look back at this, I'm like, this show had no purpose. It did nothing for me, but just basically caused nightmares for me. And I invested so much time into this for my child. I remember also even today, some of us invest our time in so many other things like, like social media and YouTube and videos. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting at home and before I know it, I'm like, I'm like yeah, I'm just kind of scrolling through and you fall into that one little video and before you know it, you're three hours deep into videos, right? You're like, I just fell into the wormhole of videos. Please tell me I'm not alone in this. Um, I'm pretty sure there's some other guys and you're going, yep, done it, been there. And they're the dumbest videos in the world that some kid like sitting somewhere just decided they'd make this video and now they're making millions millions of dollars doing it. I'm like, yep, should have thought of that one um, kind of thing. But they're shooting these videos, right? And I, and I just sit there in one video because they play right after the next, after the next. And next thing I know, I've looked and I've invested three hours of my life into something that has absolutely no value in my life. We do that with all kinds of things. We think these bring value to us. But the reality is this, we're investing in things that do not matter. What we should be doing is investing in the one who matters the most. We should be surrendering to him daily so that when we step out into this community, that we are the reason that people experience the gospel truth of Jesus. But it's because many times we're not willing to yield our own ways in order to follow God's ways. Because we're so invested in that practice for my kid. And that experience for my family. And that post 
Not that anything's wrong with those things. Please don't, don't go home thinking, oh, I'm just living like a alien. There it goes. I probably shouldn't have said that. But we're, I'm living this way, right? It's my life. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we need to take moments in our life where we just surrender and say, God, I, I want to invest in my relationship with you. Because I know that when my relationship is enhanced and my investment in, in, in my relationship with Christ is better, then I'll make a difference in this world for his name's sake. And then the last thing is this. We've got to live out the reason. We've got to live out the reason. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 12 says, live. It says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, because it's going to happen. You're going to get accused. People are going to say the things that you're doing are wrong. But though they accuse you of doing what's wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Other translations say that they will observe the good deeds because we have lived out who Christ is. See, the sad part is this. When I read that statement on my board, I thought to myself, you know, it's a, it's a great little statement. I'm, I mean, it's from a seven-year-old, and I thought, this is kind of cool. One day I'll be able to look at my son and say, hey, you know what? Uh, I preached a sermon because of something that you wrote. But more than what I thought on that was this. How many of us are, are not being the reason? How many times because of the way we live, people are going, I'm not going there. Instead of us as followers of Christ truly living out in such a way that people go, no, no, I, I, got, I got to go to that house. I got to go worship. I got to be a part of that. Man, they, they carry a truth that I've never heard before. They're experiencing something I've never experienced. They're living in a way that I've never, I've never lived before. But the sad part to me is how many times is it the opposite of that? That people go, I'm not going there because of the way that person's living. I'm not going there because of the way they talk and act. And they're no different than me, so why would I waste my time getting up to go? Why would I give up the things that I like to go and do that? Because they're no different. They're not living. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understandings. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. The message paraphrase of scripture, I like the way it says it, but I wanted to read it from the NIV first before I read the paraphrase because it says it in a way that I really like. And it says this, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. How often do we try to figure out everything on our own? Man, I do all the time. Man, we're bad about that. I'm, I'm awful about it. I ain't looking at the instructions, man. I'm like, I'll figure this thing out. I got this. I'm smart enough. I got a degree, right? Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. So the question is, how willing are we to trust God in our lives? Are we not living out because we don't truly trust him? Are we not living out as though we are one that has a purpose to live? Are we not living out in such a way that, that truly shows who Christ is because we just really don't trust him? Or it just doesn't make sense to us, right? It doesn't make sense for me to live in that way. Lean not on your own understandings. You're right, it doesn't make sense. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm not going to stand before you today and say that, that being a follower of Christ is, is, is going to be all hunky-dory and everything's going to be perfect and everything's going to be great and you're never going to have a moment in your life or a circumstance in your life again. But can I tell you this? God doesn't always change your situations because of your faith. Sometimes instead he changes you because of your faith. The situations may still be there. But 
but you can be the reason because of your faith in Christ and you've lived it out. You can be the reason that somebody hears the gospel today because you're willing to live it out. Because God has changed you through your trust in him, your faith in him. Because I need you to understand that God cannot be the source of your strength if the world is the source of your standards. And so many of us try to live by the standards of this world, but yet we want the, we want the strength from God, but he can't be the source of our strength if the world is the source of our standards. If we're going to make disciples, if we're truly going to be a disciple-making generation, like Pastor Matt spoke about last week, it, then we've got to stop making excuses and we've got to start somewhere. And we've got to start saying, today's the day that I'm going to live it out. Today's the day that I'm going to live the reason. And that reason, his name is Jesus. I'm going to live it out for Jesus. I want everybody to hear about my Jesus. There's something in that name. There is power in that name. And I'm excited about this name. I'm not holding it back anymore. I've got the cure for their sin. I've got the cure. Let's bring him home, people. Let's bring him into the room. Let's let people experience him like never before because I'm willing to live it out. I need you to understand what Jesus thinks of you though. So just listen for just a moment as I read this to you. When Jesus speaks directly to us, he speaks in this way. He says, I walked on water for you. I called you. I knocked down barriers for you. I personally chose you. I pursued you. I died for you. I will never, ever give up on you. I made you royalty. I will fight your battles for you. I celebrate with you. I am here for you. I have forgiven you. I know you. I will catch you when you fall. I kept my promise for you. I bring you light in the darkness. I bring you hope when you are hopeless. You are my child and I love you. So what is stopping you from being the reason today? Is it because you don't know him? Today you can. Today you can know him. Or maybe you do know him. What's stopping you from being the reason? Maybe because you just haven't experienced him lately. Maybe you've been investing in the wrong things. Today I challenge you. Be the reason. Be the reason that that waitress today hears about Jesus. That waiter at your restaurant, that that guy standing on the other side at a pump while you're pumping gas hears about Jesus. That that young lady that's that's working the cash register today when you go pick up your groceries to, to get your groceries, that she sees Jesus, that she hears about Jesus. Be the reason this week that your that your employees or, or the people you work with or your family. They experience Jesus. They hear this truth. Let's be the reason. Let's stop not being the reason. And let's start today. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us a reason to worship. That it's because of you and your son who died for us that brings us life and victory over sin. God, may that not just be a story. May it not just be something that we've heard over and over at church. But God, today I pray that as we, as, we, as we step out of this place, maybe we step into a life group, maybe we leave and we, we head out to this world. But today will be the day that we decide that either we need to know you for who you are, reason so that others may know you so that others may experience you and may step into a relationship with you God we need to take the shot today is the day let us not put it off anymore so God move in this place I pray it's in your name we pray Amen